Hey, hey guys, it's Kathy. Oh, Three moments. There we go. There we go. Okay. Can you hear it? So um, it's my first time doing a YouTube live and I've got my gal Angelina on the phone here on speakerphone. So, Hi guys. <laughs> so she's kind of my right hand gal. And so she's just going to help um, help out with this whole um, live event. Like I said, it's our first time using YouTube. So if I'm missing questions, um, not noticing things, she'll you know bring it to my attention, hopefully. So um, bear with us as we kind of figure everything out. So um, super happy to do this today. And I have a list of questions that many of you have submitted ahead of time. Then I will try to address as many as I can. So I'd like to do these uh, live events weekly. If possible, I know a lot of you are, are home, either doing online classes or having your classes canceled. Um, so I just really want to support as many students as I can and help out as much of you know as much as I can. So um, for our part, we'll try to do some uh, live Q Q and A's weekly if we can pull it off. So um, with that in mind, um, I know a lot of the um, a lot of students out there are just asking for um, my perspective with the whole coronavirus thing going on right now, and um, so it's you know it's crazy. I've heard concerns from a lot of students that their you know their clinicals are being canceled. I know at my hospital clinics have been um, canceled. I was having nursing students come and uh, shadow me uh, every week, but they're no longer doing that. Um, I know sometimes people have had their NCLEX uh, canceled or maybe their exit exams as well. I've also heard that some schools are making some accommodations or trying to in terms of uh, clinical hours and using like online simulations. And I've also heard of other schools like bringing a handful of students in at a time to do an exit exam so that we're still maintaining social distancing. And then um, someone here on the chat too, um, I think it was Holly, mentioned something about ATI um, live sessions. So um, it sounds like there are some things trying to be done out there to keep students on track for being able to finish your classes and stay on track for um, graduation. But that's definitely not all schools. Um, at least that's my feeling from talking, um, you know, from seeing students' comments. So I really encourage you to share what's being done at your school. If your school's doing some things to really help you move ahead in your program, and maybe for you, you know, other students who have schools which aren't doing as much, you can bring forth some of those ideas and really advocate for you and your classmates. Um, from a nursing perspective for um, RNs um, at the hospital, my key concern um, continues to be um, with PPE, so protective gear. Um, supplies are running low, and I am concerned that um, PPE requirements um, and what they are asking us to use for PPE is really being based on supply chain constraints as opposed to actual science. You know, it's somewhat unclear whether this is an airborne or droplet precaution type of situation. And um, I, I feel strongly that we really need to um, really solidify our understanding of, of how this um, virus is transmitted and really allow for proper protection um, for our frontline workers, our doctors and our RNs. And it just makes me sad and scared um, that there is a, a PPE uh, shortage out there. So those are just some of my, um, a couple of my two cents about coronavirus. Um, I would just encourage you to just to stay really well informed with um, good sources such as the CDC to know um, what's going on to understand what it means to flatten the curve, right? And why social distancing is important and to really just help educate your friends and family around you so that we can try to um, you know, decrease transmission and really save lives. So any, um, any questions from you guys about um, 
coronavirus or doing stuff online. Um, I see Jayla, all my classes are online, med surge, and I don't know how to stay focused. Um, I can't stay at home and all libraries and campuses are shut down. Okay, so we do have a nursing planner um, on our website, levelupRN.com, where you can like put in your classes and kind of your deadlines for assignments and tests, and then just try to build out a schedule. So really putting together a plan for what you need to study and how you need to study is really important. And Angelina, I'm getting feedback, girl. So I think I got to, um, let me... Let me mute you, I think. Um, I gotta, what, unless you could do someone on your end. I think I got to mute you. I can hear it. Um, so um, putting together a plan to be able to stay focused is really helpful. And so just, um, you know, break the workout into bite-sized pieces. So, um, so for example... If you want, if you're working on medications, maybe you work on medications for the nervous system and really focus that on that for a couple of days and then move on to another system. Um, so really breaking it, breaking the workout into manageable chunks and our, you know, our videos and cards are here to help you as well. And um, yeah, sorry about the feedback guys. I, I just hung up on Angelina. So we thought, I thought it might be helpful to have her there to kind of remind me about stuff, but it totally didn't work out as far as feedback. So sorry about that. Um, okay. Let's see what other questions we got going on here right now. Um, are your pharmacology cards good to prepare for the HESI? Yeah. So basically um, all the different testing platforms, whether it's ATI, HESI, Kaplan, you world, et cetera, they really all ask the same, they ask questions on the same nursing concepts, those same fundamental, you know, nursing things that you need to know. So as long as you have a strong base of those nursing concepts, then really you're going to do well on any of these exams. So really our products, um, videos and cards are really focused on helping you build that strong foundation. So it doesn't matter what type of test you take, you should do really well, including um, HESI. Okay. Um, let's see. Yeah. I hear some of you, um, this is Sophie. I'm going to be a student nurse in the ICU this summer. I'm missing my med surge clinical and I'm scared that I'm going to be so behind. Um, how do you become more comfortable talking to and assessing patients? It really just takes practice, right? It just, and, and it's hard when you're home and your clinical has been canceled. I get that. That's, um, that's really hard. So I don't know, maybe some things you can do would be to, if you've got a family member or husband or, you know, boyfriend or kiddo or whatever, you can practice doing like head to toe assessments on family members and um, and also just look to some online resources, maybe role play with friends or family members as best you can. I mean, nothing replaces um, getting real world practice with actual patients, of course, but you gotta do what you can in the meantime. Okay, um, I graduated from nursing school, but I was unable to take my NCLEX yet due to testing centers shutting down. Is there anything I can work on or do to help during this time um, without a license? So, um, so it sounds like you're you're ready to take your NCLEX. You're like prepared for that. So there are some things you can um, do to help at this time. One thing is there's like a huge blood shortage, right? So the Red Cross is really desperate for blood donations. And um, if you can go, if you're willing to go out and do a blood donation, they are desperately needed right now. Um, like I shared earlier, I would really help to educate the people around you about the need for social distancing and what it means to flatten the curve, right? If we don't do this social distancing, we'll have many cases all at once, which will overwhelm our hospital systems and people will die, right? There's only so many IC rooms and there's only so many respirators. So we have to really slow the transmission so that we can care for everybody as they get sick. Um, other things you can do, if you have older neighbors, elderly neighbors, 
um, then definitely give them a call when you go to the grocery store to get stuff for your family, maybe pick them up some items that they need and drop them off at their doorstep so they don't have to worry about going out themselves. So really just look out for your community during this time too. Okay. Um, Moving classes online are not the best idea. I feel like instructors just go over the PowerPoint and leave us to read the books, which is really tough to know what is important and what not to focus on. So I hear you. <laughs> I hear you. The books, these nursing books are humongous. And like, what should you be focused on? There's a lot of there's a lot of fluff in there. So um, really, that's kind of where Level Up RN was born. So I'm, you know, my videos, my cards, I really try to boil down all of this information into key, um, key concepts um, that you can easily understand and digest. So definitely look to um, our resources for help with that. Let's see. Do you see there being an extreme need for nurses that um, they emergency certify like they did in other countries. Maybe it will come to that. Um, it, it could, it's, it's, it's hard to say. Um, like I said, the clinicals have been canceled just because they don't want to um, increase exposure. And also like if you have a new nursing student who is new to putting on PPE, we don't want to risk, um, you know, cross contamination and, you know, issues due to inexperience. I know there's a lot of nurses there that are right there at the finish line, trying to get their NCLEX done and become a nurse. Um, and I, I feel you. I like, I understand why you're like sad and maybe angry or frustrated and you want to get out there and help. Um, so I feel that on the other hand, let me just say that it's, you know, it's, it's kind of scary out there right now in terms of, like I said, the PPE shortages and the um, very rapidly rising cases. So um, I have heard from some new grad nurses who are pretty overwhelmed and a little scared. And so, um, you know, I ideally in a, you know, in an ideal world, you would be able to start in on the floor, not in a national pandemic situation, get your skill base up before being thrown into something like COVID-19. Okay, yeah. So um, Red Cross is desperately in need of blood donations. If you can help with that, that is great. Um, let's see, other questions here. Started my OB class last week. Now that we are online only, we are to learn all on our own. This is very challenging. Recommendations, will you sell OB cards again. So um, we have a lot of plans um, for upcoming products. So definitely um, sign up on our email newsletter on our website, levelupRN.com. I do have quite a few um, maternal newborn videos um, available to help you at this time. And just keep in mind, you know, you're obviously learning a lot during nursing school and at clinicals, but you're going to be learning a whole lot more as a new grad nurse. So just, you know, take a deep breath and just know um, that, you know, for a new grad program, they're going to assign you a preceptor. You're going to have skills check off. You're not going to be thrown in there, hopefully, um, without getting the necessary training and certification and help from a preceptor. So when I was in nursing school, there were certain skills that I never got to, you know, do hands on. Like I never put in an NG tube uh, as a nursing student. And um, honestly, I'd be happy never to put in an NG tube for the rest of my life because it's really awful for the patient. It's like my least favorite thing to do. Um, and I don't really do it as a wound nurse anymore, but um, I did have to do it as a uh, med surge floor nurse. So again, and I don't think I ever changed an ostomy appliance as um, as a nursing student. And I don't think I ever set up like uh, tube feeding for a patient as a nursing student. So it's okay. It's okay that you don't get experience with some of these things. You definitely need to know the procedure and generally like the important things, you know, about that procedure, but you can absolutely get your preceptor to show you and you're going to need to be signed off on those skills. And you can always um, rope in your mentor nurse or your charge nurse to help you as well to learn those skills. So don't freak out too much about um, those things that, the hospital system that hopefully will employ you after nursing school will help you gain those skills and get comfortable with those things. Okay. 
Let's see. I heard two thirds of Corona cases in Italy that are um, in the ICU or people under 50. There's not many deaths though. Do people under 50 need to be worried? Yes. So my understanding um, from the sources I've read is that the number of cases for younger people is um, increasing. So when you see images of people like on spring break and these huge crowds and like, we don't care, we're young, we're not gonna get this virus. It's really short-sighted and kind of irresponsible, right? One, young people can get coronavirus and they can end up in the ICU on a ventilator and they can die. Like the death rates are definitely lower, but they're not zero. And all that social contact is just increasing um, transmission. So um, it's a little frustrating to see that. Okay. Hi, Kathy. I'm a new nurse. I am starting um, my first job as a nurse. Uh, man, you guys are sending tons of questions my way. <laughs> I can't even read them all in time. Let's see. Uh, just go. I'm in leadership, blah, blah, blah. Oh, I'm just starting my new job as a nurse. I just got accepted to two jobs on a cardiac unit and a med surge. Which one should I take? Wow. Well, you know, I think either one might be pretty good. Um, I might take the cardiac one because getting cardiac experience would be great. And there's so many different places you can take that, right? You can go to a cath lab or to ICU or to the emergency department. And even with cardiac patients, you're going to get med surge type things you're going to have to um, deal with for that patient as well. So it's kind of like having med surge plus cardiac. So if it were me, I'd do cardiac, but it's really what you're passionate about. Okay. They are making us do busy work like SIM chart makeup clinicals. What will happen next semester because we are missing out with, with busy work? Yeah, I hear you. Busy work is the worst. Um, you know, care plans, not my favorite. There's aspects of care plan that are really beneficial um, and valuable, but there's there's definitely busy work in nursing school. I, I, I agree. So, um, and I don't know there's anything you can do about it. So I'm sorry. Let's see. Um, okay, Angelina is telling me some stuff here. Let's see, do you have a friend in the States? Okay, she's dealing with like, when are, where are cards available? All right, so do you guys want to talk about um, some of the questions I got ahead of time were about how to approach some NCLEX style questions, um, how to do priority setting for patient care, ADPI, therapeutic communication, Maslow's hierarchy. Do you want to talk about um, basically how to answer questions and how to do some priority setting, if that sounds good to you guys? So I'll gonna, I'm just going to dive into that and we'll see how it goes. And then I'll kind of look back to questions and see where you guys want to take this q and I'm really flexible. And like I said, I want to do this weekly. So if I don't answer your question today, um, I'll try to do it next time for sure. Okay, so hopefully you guys are familiar with the ABCDE um, kind of priority setting guidelines for nursing. So A is for airway, right? We want to secure the airway. However, what is that one thing we want to check for that will help dictate how we secure that airway, right? It's trauma. If we suspect, if a patient has had trauma and we suspect that they may have had like a cervical spine injury, so basically injury to the vertebrae of the neck, then that is something we're going to want to assess first before we secure that airway. Because if we suspect a cervical spine injury, we're not going to want to use the head tilt chin lift maneuver to secure the airway, right? We're going to have to use a modified jaw thrust maneuver instead. So when we talk about ABC, cervical spine is kind of really at the top because how we um, secure the airway will depend on that. So we've got airway and then we have breathing, right? So what is the patient's respiratory rate and how are they breathing? If it's, you know, deep, shallow. So if their respiratory rate is um, six breaths a minute, that's a problem, right? Are they on opioid analgesics? Do we need to go get some naloxone for them? So breathing is next after we secure the airway. And then we have circulation. So this is like their blood pressure, their pulse, that type of thing. Then we get down to D, which is disability, which is like assessing the patient's level of consciousness. 
And then E is for exposure, which is assessing the patient's body for trauma or exposure to like heat or cold. So um, in most situations, when you're looking at an exam question, they're asking you what's the priority intervention, it will usually fall within that first, the first three. So A, B, or C. Um, so just keep that in mind. All right, let's talk about the next thing that can help you with these questions, which is to assess before taking action. So when you get a question, what is the um, priority nursing action for this patient with this particular situation? As a nurse, you always want to assess first before you take action. So if the patient, for example, if they're reporting uh, shortness of breath, you just want to, you don't want to just get on the phone with the provider and notify the provider, right? You want to um, assess their breathing status. You're going to want to listen to their lung sounds so that you have complete information before you take action or notify the provider. So always assess before action. Another thing is that you want to care for unstable patients first before you care for stable patients. All right. So a stable patient has may have some stuff going on, but if it is expected for their particular medical diagnosis, then that's important to know. So if a patient had a stroke, for example, and they have facial drooping, well, if they had a stroke like two days ago and they still have that facial drooping, this is not a new unexpected finding for this patient. So that patient would likely not be the priority. Also, if you have a patient with chronic COPD, so someone who has COPD, their um, SpO2 levels are going to be lower than normal. So normally we want oxygenation between 95 and 100%. COPD patients are gonna be living in those like low 90s range. So if you have a COPD patient, who has a um, oxygen saturation of like 91%, that's actually expected. And that patient is likely not going to be your priority. However, if you have a patient with a DVT, right, a deep vein thrombosis, and suddenly they have shortness of breath and chest pain, guess what? That patient is probably going to be your priority, but you know, possibly not. There may be someone um, above that, but that's really affecting their breathing, and that's an unstable patient, and that patient would need your attention. Okay, um, let's talk about like acute versus um, chronic conditions. So, an example of a chronic condition is a pressure injury or pressure ulcer as some schools may refer to it. So pressure injury is the more accurate term these days. But if a patient has a like a stage four pressure injury over their like coccyx bone, that's taken a while for that pressure injury to take place. It's a chronic condition and we definitely need to address it. So I'm not saying don't address the pressure injury. I'm just saying that if there's a patient who has a respiratory rate of six because of an opioid overdose, they're gonna be priority over the patient with a pressure injury who needs care, okay? Um, and then also we want to prioritize systemic issues over local issues. So if a patient has like a, a huge skin tear on their leg, right? We're gonna wanna care for that at some point, but is that patient gonna get priority over another patient's whose blood pressure is tanking and their white blood cell count is really high? No, we're gonna be dealing with the patient with the unstable vital signs and with that elevated white blood cell count before we go and like fix a skin tear on another patient. So definitely um, look at the issues that your patients are having and you want to address systemic issues before you address local issues. Um, let's talk about um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs. So, if you know it's the, the little uh, pyramid there and at the bottom are physiological needs, right? So we need, you know, we need air, we need food, we need these things to live. So we have these physiological needs um, that are required. The next part up on the pyramid is safety. So we need to be in a secure environment 
um, and decrease our risk of being hurt. Then we have love and belonging and then, a, you know, self-esteem and then like self-actualization. So you can imagine right now with the coronavirus, we're really not focused on helping patients with self-actualization at this point. So when you think about who is your um, priority patient, then definitely think about that Maslow's hierarchy of needs and know that if there is a patient who has some um, physiological needs, like for food or oxygen, um, that type of thing, then that's going to be our priority patient versus someone who is um, needing more like love and belonging, that type of thing. So physiological needs always take priority. Um, another thing, you always want to try least invasive um, methods of dealing with a situ situation before going to more invasive. So if you have a patient who's like trying to pull out their IV or pull off their oxygen or whatever, we don't just slap the restraints on them, right? So let's try um, distraction. We may need to have a sitter or a constant observer sit with them. We should try anything we can before we like put restraints or do something um, more invasive like that. So that's another um, way to try to, um, you know, that would be helpful when you have a question like, what should you do first? And um, so hopefully that's helpful. So those are some important things to consider as you're working through the different questions. Okay, let's see. Um, Let's see. I'm just looking at questions here to see where we're at. Angelina, is there anything um, that I need to address based on all the stuff um, I just went over? Let's see. And hello from Georgia. Hello from Kenya. Very cool. Okay. So let's talk about therapeutic communication as well. This is a really, really important thing to know for all your exams and as a nurse when you are caring for patients. So let's talk about some things you don't want to do in terms of therapeutic communication. So you do not want to say why, right? If one of the choices starts with why, then chances are that's not the right answer because it kind of puts the um, patient on the defensive. You're like, why would you do this? then patients like, you know, feeling a little defensive and threatened. So um, any question that starts with why is um, likely not going to be right. You also don't want to offer your opinion or advice. So you don't want to be like, well, if it were me, I would do this um, because that's just not really helpful. You more want to use kind of open communication and encourage the patient to talk and ways you can do that would be like, you seem like you're really upset about this. Um, can you tell me more about what you're feeling? Or, you know, what are your thoughts on this? What are you thinking in terms of your choices? Really, you want to draw the patient out, have them talk and ask open-ended questions um, and encourage them to share. Okay. So when you're picking the, like the therapeutic response, um, on an exam question, definitely look for that response that is encouraging the patient to share more. Um, so again, you don't want to ask closed ended questions. So like, yes, no questions that doesn't really encourage the patient to talk more. You want to use those open ended questions. Um, you also don't want to change the subject or minimize the patient, like what they're feeling. And that's about it. In some cases, you can offer, um, do a little um, basically offering of self, which is just sharing some information um, about yourself, but make it really brief and make sure it's relevant and really turn the attention back to the patient um, pretty quickly. After. We'll get really good at these questions. Um, if you do, like I did a couple hundred while I was in nursing school, and then these type of questions come really um, fairly easy at that point, because you can pick out that response that encourages the patient to talk more. Okay, um, let's see. So that was therapeutic communication. Um, all right, so I did have um, several people ask me how to survive the first year as a new nurse and how to deal with hospital drama and chaos and how to protect your license, okay? So 
being a new nurse is it's a lot. It's hard. I, I, you know, I'm not going to lie to you. It's, it's a lot to take in. It's a lot to learn. And so you need to give yourself a lot of grace and a lot of patience as you are learning. You're not going to like go in there out of the gate and feel confident and comfortable and like have it all together. So um, just keep that in mind going in that you're need you're going to need to give yourself a lot of patience and that you will get there. Okay. Lot to learn. Hopefully you get a great preceptor who's really good at helping you and encouraging you and is a, a good resource um, for you. Um, so just know going in that it's going to be tough. You want to make sure you ask a lot of questions, ask for help. So find your resource nurse on the floor or your mentor nurse. Different hospital systems call um, people in that role different things. Nine times out of 10, that person's going to be really helpful for you. You can bounce ideas off of them, um, ask them that, you know, to help you with different skills. So when I was on night shift, um, I had my resource nurse, her name was Sarah, and she was amazing. And she was so nice and encouraging. I was really, really lucky. And I, I definitely took advantage of that. Like I asked her like everything and I kind of stunk it putting IVs in. It was really, really frustrating. Um, I did pretty good in nursing school and I, I got done with nursing school and I thought, oh yeah, I got this. I know how to put IVs in. And I just kept messing up over, like just not getting the vein, you know, patients come in there, um, with a lot of comorbidities and some of the times getting those IVs started are, it's really tough. It's, it's harder than you might think. So, um, I would bring my mentor in Sarah, to help me right at the bedside and to watch me. So I didn't want to freak out the patient, right? That, that I'm having to bring my mentor nurse in there. So I would say something like, um, Hey, Mr. Smith, um, I'm here to start your IV. And I brought my, um, my resource nurse, Sarah with me because she's like super expert and I just want her to watch so she can offer any pointers as we do this. So again, you're going to want to walk into that room. And even though you might be really nervous, like sometimes I was really nervous, you want to act very cool, very collected, very calm, and not like freak out the patient, right? Because if you freak out the patient, like you go in there, I'm like, I'm really not good at this, but I'm going to try to do it. And maybe your hand's shaking, like you're going to really flip out your patient. And then all their veins are going to, they're going to just go away because of their whole, you know, fight or flight response with the vasoconstriction. So anyway, fake it till you make it. Don't fake like procedures you haven't done, but really fake that kind of confidence and that calm so that you in turn um, help calm down your patient and give them confidence in your abilities. So ask questions, ask for help, make use of your resource and mentor RN. Um, in terms of protecting your license, charting, 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 charting is so, so important. Um, and you're going to want to make sure you do um, really complete charting. Anytime you are escalating issues to like the doctor or whatever, you want to chart that. You want to put that in your notes. Um, MD notified at whatever time. Note whether you got a response or not. If you didn't get a response, you need to chart how you escalated the issue further. Um, you want to chart if your patient is refusing to turn or take medications, whatever, you need to chart that very explicitly, okay? So charting is how you keep yourself safe um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, you also don't want to do procedures or skills that you haven't done before or that you're not qualified to do. So you don't want to just go in and like wing something, right? If you haven't done something before, you need to get your preceptor or your charge nurse or your mentor nurse to come in there with you and um, explain and watch you do it for the first time so you can feel comfortable. So don't go in there and go crazy on something. If you're not sure, ask. Um, sometimes that can be uncomfortable. Like sometimes new nurses feel like I should know this, right? I shouldn't have to ask this, but better safe than sorry. Just ask, swallow your pride and ask the questions so you can keep your patient safe and so you can also protect your license, okay? Um, drama. Okay. Hospital drama. So sometimes, um, new nurses have trouble with like older, more experienced nurses who 
um, maybe cannot be very nice and can be a little bullying at times. So I just want to offer this, you know, it, this little bit of advice. It may not work like all the time, um, but it's worked pretty well for me in the past. These nurses who are older have been there a long time. They have this wealth of experience um, that you don't have, right? They've been there a long time. They have seen a lot of stuff. They know their they know their stuff. So if you do a little bit of like ego stroking and just really recognize that um, they are way experienced and that you would like to eventually be as skilled and experienced as they are and that you would love to have their advice or help, if you do that, I think that goes a long way into kind of diffusing that situation. So um, cause really at the end of the day, I think they just want some acknowledgement of their skills and experience. And honestly, that stuff is gold. And, um, I would love to be able to like, you know, through osmosis, take in those 30 years of experience and have that in my head. Um, because the more experience you have, the more confident you are and the more capable you are. So for those nurses who are maybe being mean, some of it may be their you know, I don't know, they may be resentful, these new young people, whatever, just if you can do a little ego stroking and an acknowledgement of their skills and really try to enlist their help um, and let them know that you look up to them, um, sometimes that helps. Okay, let's see. At what point did you start to feel comfortable in a hospital setting um, as a student? Well, um, and then like comfortable with knowing what re nursing respons re responsibilities were expected of you. So yeah, going into the hospital as a nursing student can be kind of awkward, right? And sometimes you get a really nice nurse who's like great and they, she takes you under her wing and she shows you everything. And that's so awesome when that happens, right? And then sometimes you get that nurse who is like rolling their eyes. You can like literally see them rolling their eyes and they are not excited to have a nursing student. I think as, you know, I, I think we've all had that kind of nurse eventually, right? So let, let me know if um, I'm right here, but I definitely had that kind of nurse a number of times um, during my clinical rotations. And I don't think I know a single person who hasn't had that kind of nurse. It's a bummer. It's a bummer when that happens, when you get a nurse who really doesn't want a student and is not really doing anything to help you learn and grow um, as a nursing student. So I, it's hard to know um, what advice to give in that situation other than you just got to stick it out over the day and hope for a better nurse next time. Or if you have any um, option to have a different nurse who is eager to help and have you um, join them, then definitely make the switch if you can. But sometimes you just don't have that choice and you just have to deal, right? Um, I have nursing students, well, not right now because everybody got their clinicals canceled, um, but I have nursing students shadow me on a regular basis. And I love to have nursing students shadow me. So what I try to do, I try to set some expectations when you um, when you come. So like, I'll let you know kind of what we're going to do that day. And I let my nursing student know just to like follow me everywhere, right? Like when I go to talk to a doctor or go grab supplies, you just be my twin there. You just stay next to me and you come with me everywhere. You're not annoying me. I want you to hear the conversations I'm having with the doctor or the case manager or whoever. So I really set some clear expectations that I want them to be by my side. Um, and if there are exceptions to that, then I let them know. So hopefully your nurse will do those kind of expectation settings as well. If not, you can ask um, he or she, like, do you want me to just kind of follow you? Or how would you like to kind of structure the day? Let the nurse know if there are certain skills you'd love to get experience doing or things in particular you want to do or are qualified to do. So just kind of have that conversation up front if possible. And then hopefully he or she will go out of their way to make sure you get those experiences. I know when nurses, um, nursing students shadow me, I try to give them um, as much hands-on experience as I can. I have them do things that are, you know, lower risk, but I have them help as much as possible. Um, as long as I'm getting a good vibe off of the nursing student that they're being careful, careful and that they're listening, et cetera. So as a nursing student, you, you want to ask questions. You don't want to go crazy with the questions to the point where efficiency grinds to a halt, but you just want to show that you're listening and you're interested and, um, that you're going to be careful uh, with the patient. 
So um, I don't know that I 100% ever felt um, comfortable as a nursing student uh, when I was doing clinicals. Like I was always kind of on on edge. And as a new grad nurse, you know, it's I have to be honest, you know, it's, it's a little nerve wracking and it just takes a while to feel comfortable. So I've been a nurse for four years now and I can, you know, safely say that I, I go in, I'm very um, calm and comfortable. I'm very comfortable going into a patient's room and asking to assess their, you know, their booty or their wound or whatever, you know, they got wounds everywhere. A lot of times it's on the booty. So um, it's not a big deal in terms of that conversation anymore. But I can understand right out of the gate where that might be a little awkward um, as a nursing student or a, a new nurse. But trust me, with practice, you're going to be just totally comfortable going in there and, you know, talking with the patient and doing that stuff. OK. Oh, Michaela. Yeah, she did shadow me at Scripps Encinitas. So, um, yeah, I, I love my nursing students at Scripps Encinitas when they come um, shadow me. It's it's really great. It's actually really helpful for me, too, because um I do wound vac dressing changes. I do uh, wound care where I need someone to like help me position the patient or maybe like spread the butt cheeks. <laughs> and I hate to be, you know, explicit about it, but you know, you guys are nursing students, but I can use help with like positioning or pulling of skin to be able to do the wound care that I need to do. So nursing students are awesome um, for helping with those type of things. Okay, um, other things too. If you can get a job while you're in nursing school, which is going to be harder to do at this point, but um, maybe when we get through this whole pandemic, um, if you can get a job as like a CNA or a, a patient care assistant or like a transporter, if you get that kind of experience while you're in nursing school, it will also help you get more comfortable with patient care um, and you know talking with the patient and patient assessment. Um, so, and then the other thing it'll do is help you get a job when you're done with nursing school, right? Because a lot of hospital systems, when they hire new grads for like new grad programs, they definitely give priority to internal candidates. So when I was hired, they actually only gave interviews for internal candidates and they didn't hire any external candidates at that time. So being an internal candidate really definitely gives you a leg up in terms of getting a job. And it also gives you more experience with patient care. So you're not acting as an RN, but just talking with patients and kind of the like how things occur in the hospital and just the flow of work. It just, it always helps. Okay, I'm gonna, um, I'm gonna see how we're doing over here with questions. Um, let's see. I feel on edge constantly. Thank you for saying this. It's a weird thing to do assessments as a nursing student for sure. Cause you're like coming in there and you're having to do this whole head to toe assessment. You're doing all these things that, um, when you become more of an experienced nurse, you'll kind of, uh, I won't say fly through, but you'll go a little faster and have more of a focused assessment and it will make more sense. It, it is rather awkward. Um, but it's important. It's important to do all of those assessment things and just good, get good at like listening to lung sounds, listening to bowel sounds, checking pulses, all that good stuff. And state, you know, the other big piece of advice I have for nursing students as well as new nurses is have more faith in yourself and your assessment. Okay. Sometimes, uh, like when I was a new nurse, and I would do my assessment on my patient and I, I didn't hear any crackles. Like I felt like their lung sounds were kind of diminished. And then I go back to my workstation to do charting and like the three or four nurses before me all charted crackles. And I thought, oh, well then that's probably me. Like I probably didn't hear the crackles and they're probably there. Um, but that's not necessarily the case. So I go back and listen to lung sounds again um, because I had that like self doubt, right? And literally, I'm not hearing any crackles. And then if you go look at their medication history, I'm like, oh, they got Lasix, right? They got furosemide, which helped to get rid of all that extra fluid, which is probably why the crackles, um, you know, cleared up. So try not to second guess yourself. Definitely don't follow the charting that came before you just because you are kind of doubting your abilities. Um, I've seen people chart some really stupid things as a wound nurse, right? So as a wound nurse, I do audits on charting. 
um, every time I go to work actually. And I just see how people are charting on uh, pressure injuries, whether they're providing the proper care, um, et cetera. And I've seen where a nurse makes like a mistake on charting. Like for example, they chart that they put an ACE bandage on a buttock pressure injury, which it just doesn't make any sense, right? Like an ACE bandage would be for like a, an extremity, like a, a leg or an arm. But then I see that like several nurses after that nurse also charted ACE bandage on a, on a butt, right? Which just makes no sense at all. So be careful with your charting. Don't just follow the nurse before you. And as a nursing student, you often have more time to do a more thorough assessment than the nurse does because the nurse is likely running around with their head cut off, um, trying to triage certain, you know, situations. So, you know, trust, trust your ears, trust your eyes, do that thorough assessment and just get used to, um, you know, doing that. And yeah, don't fall prey to self doubt and think, Ooh, the, the nurse before me is probably right. They may have been in a hurry and not heard what you heard. Okay. All right. Let's see. Is there a way to get a CNA certification through nursing school? So that's a, that's a good question. Um, I, m my understanding, and I could be wrong on this, um, you can get your um, patient care assistant kind of certification. So we have uh, students from Cal State San Marcos who after, I think it's their med surg semester one can come over and work as a, um, a patient care assistant. So they're pretty much doing the same type of things as a CNA. Um, also, I think you can, I did have classmates who took their CNA certification exam during nursing school as well. Um, and we're able to work as a CNA during nursing school. So I think it is possible. You just might need to do a little investigation about how to make that happen. Um, Claire, Claire Matthews, our nursing school basically has you teaching our classes. So that's amazing. Um, I'm happy to help. Like I love, um, I love teaching. I love trying to help break down all of this crazy information into key concepts. And um, yeah, so it's, it's definitely a passion of mine. Okay, let's see. Yes, learn to feel confident in your head to toe makes everything easier. Yes. Let's see. Can we talk about psych mental health? We just started uh, disorders, drugs, and I'm doing horrible with the new instructor we have. Please help. Okay. Yeah, psych mental health. So with psych and mental health, there are a lot of medications to know. So definitely um, set aside the amount of time you need to learn those. So if you go to my, I have pharmacology flashcards, which include those psych drugs. In addition, I have a lot of videos that um, also cover those psychiatric uh, medications. And those are gonna be really important medications for you to know um, for your mental health rotation, for your exams, and just as a practicing nurse as well. So when you're looking at medications and trying to learn those, um, I would definitely know what the indications are, like what the drug is used for. Is it used for depression or anxiety or schizophrenia or bipolar? Know how it's used. I would just be familiar with the mode of action and then some of the key side effects. And definitely pay attention to side effects that are very unique for that medication or are very serious. A lot of medications have a black box warning. Definitely want to pay attention to that. And then um, look at key points um, about administering that medication. So I go over these key points in my cards and my videos. So that should um, totally help. But my main mes message here is that there are a lot of psych meds. You definitely have to know them in terms of your clinical experience for mental health. The thing that I found when I did my mental health um, rotation is I found that in my class, the teacher would talk about all these like, you know, therapeutic interventions and things we should do to, to help a patient who has a mental health disorder. And then I would go to clinicals and just <laughs> not see a lot of that going on, right? I would see some group therapy, and um, medications being given and a lot of charting, but not a lot of that therapeutic communication. Um, but I still encourage you to practice those 
therapeutic communication techniques with those patients there when you're doing your mental health um, rotation. So it was that was definitely a big eye opener for me um, that semester when I was at a behavioral health unit. So we, you know, I learned about bipolar disorder, but if you can talk with a patient who has bipolar disorder, boy, does that help everything sink in. Like you kind of get it that they're, when you talk about mania or manic, um, I guess I like, I read about it. I heard about it in school. Um, but you don't have a real appreciation for what that looks like until you talk with a patient who has that going on, then it makes like all the sense in the world. So, um, I'm definitely sad for you guys who don't get to have that rotation. Cause that would be really helpful, but trust that you will always have, um, psych patients, whether you work on a behavioral health unit or just on a med surge unit or wherever, psych issues are everywhere. And, um, and so those therapeutic interventions that you're learning and therapeutic communication, those are going to come in handy no matter where you go. Okay. Let's see. How do you balance nursing and family when you don't have a lot of family support? Oh boy, that's tough guys. That's tough. Um, because I, I personally do have really good family support. I have, um, I have an amazing husband. I've, we've been married almost 25 years. So I've been married a long time and he's, um, he's really like my best friend. And, uh, when I decided to go back for nursing school, this is a second career for me. Um, sure. You don't want to just use that and work. And I'm like, yeah, I don't really want to do that anymore. I really want to be a nurse. So, um, he sacrificed a lot. Um, and I, it would have been really hard to go to nursing school without his support and help. He's, he's pretty amazing. So when you don't have family support, that's tough. I mean, if you have a network of friends um, or other people that you can lean on for support, then definitely do that. Maybe some classmates who may be in a similar situation. Maybe you guys um, kind of lean on each other and help each other. It's, um, yeah, it's tough when you don't have that support. And um, I've been blessed and really lucky that I've had that. So if other people have experience um, getting through a nursing program, being a nurse without family support, then I would love to have you provide your advice, um, you know, for the student as well. Okay, let's see. I'm a new nurse in the ICU, been on the unit for almost three months. I feel like I'm still slow at my time management. Any tips on improving time management. Um, also, I overthink any tips to improve that. So yeah, you're like three months, you're not gonna be very efficient um, yet. So being efficient and managing your time really effectively, it, it takes practice. So here are um, a few pieces of advice just to um, think about. So when you are like going to the supply room, to grab something, really think about all the things you're going to need. Maybe like walk through the procedure you're about to do and, and think about all the things you need to gather. Like maybe get one of those little buckets, try to get everything you need with one trip to the supply room and bring it there. So that'll, that'll help with efficiency. Going back to a supply room over and over and over definitely slows you down. Um, Try to get your um, charting in right after you do a certain procedure. Um, it's much harder to remember everything later on in the day. I realize that in a um, that that's what you want to do in a perfect world. And some days on the floor are crazy train, and you don't get to chart until two or three p.m. But ideally, chart as you go um, to get that done instead of waiting to do all your charting at the end and trying to remember all the things you did. Okay. Um, other ways to be efficient. Um, again, saving trips to the supply room. Um, and when you go into the medication room to pull meds, maybe first ask the patient if they're in pain or there's anything else you can get them before you go there. So you can just get it all at once and come in there. So really it's about making sure you're well prepared when you go in the patient's room and you're not going back and forth to the Pixis or to the supply room and just experience and time will help. So just give yourself some grace and, and patience. Okay. It'll come. All right. Let's see what else we got here. Um, 
Our three-day ATI review got canceled. Would you be able to make an NCLEX review videos? Yeah, so my videos and cards help with all of the nursing exams. So it will help you with NCLEX. It'll help you with predictor exams as well as class exams. So like I kind of shared earlier on, if you build that core nursing knowledge and learn those core nursing concepts, you're going to be well positioned for any of these tests. They just ask questions a little differently. So in addition to kind of building that foundation, you definitely need to practice with practice exams and get good at answering questions. The more practice exams, the better. And as you're taking those practice exams, I want you to really, really read each rationale and explanation very carefully. Even if you got the question right, read them all because those are important clues and concepts that you'll need to learn and will help you with future exams, okay? And then if you got the question wrong, then really I would recommend going back and reading the applicable section in your textbook to get, um, you know, to get your knowledge up so that next time you get a question about that same topic, you're gonna be better prepared, okay? Um, Let's see, you are such an inspiration. You guys are sweet. This is also my second career and I have a supportive hubby who is also my BFF and three teenagers. Oh, wow, Liz, she's got three, I've got two. Um, thanks for your hard work. Yeah, so my kids are 18 and 17. Everybody's home now, so you might actually hear them in the background like closing a door too loud or whatever. Um, we're all getting used to being together. Um, my daughter came home from UC Berkeley. Last, well, we went and got her um, begrudgingly <laughs> for her. She, uh, we went and got her from UC Berkeley last uh, last weekend. Brought her home. Um, she, you know, she's bummed, right? She and just like you guys are bummed with your clinicals and your classes, and this is just not what you expected or you signed up for. So. She was in the zone at school, had her friends, had her classes, had her like independent life. And now she's home and I'm making them do dishes and I'm waking her up um, on conference calls at 8 a.m. <laughs> so she's, she's not super happy with me, but that's just how it goes. Um, so yeah, three teenagers, whew, I don't know how you do that. Okay. Let's see. Hi, Kathy. I am a senior nursing student in my last semester. Just want to tell you that my study group and I love you, your videos and cards. They have helped us so much. Thank you. You are so welcome. I am so happy um, that I can help. I It just brings me a lot of joy. Help people along their journey, help you understand the material better, be more confident going into your classes and your exams. That's what's um, really, really important to me. Okay. Um, so, oh, wow, we went an hour, guys. That like flew by. So I know so I probably didn't answer all the questions. I know I didn't even answer all the questions that I prepared um, based on what you guys submitted ahead of time. But um, I will um, do this again next week. I don't have the date and time yet, but definitely um, we will announce that. Angelina will set that up and um, submit your questions. And we'll just, we'll just keep doing this every week. I'm going to keep it kind of chill and laid back um, like we did today and, um, and together I'll just hopefully support you, help you get through this difficult time. And, um, anyway, thanks everybody for your support. It's been really fun. So take care and I will, um, I'll see you next week, uh, date and time to be determined. Thanks again.